Hello folks, this is Ben, that's Jack, and we're back at it again, ranting and raving all things sci-fi, comic book, or just pure nerdiness. This week, it's my turn to rant. It's going to be something very obscure, whether or not that DC would ever do it, but they've proven the point with Wonder Woman that they can make a superhero movie based on a big war event, such as the World War... Was it World War One or World War II? Uh, World War II, I think. I could, I could be wrong. Yeah, but nonetheless, they proved the point that they could easily do a film based on a big war event that's happened in history, but had some elements of comic bookness to it. Yeah. So with that in mind... My idea for this week is to try and tap into this sort of more obscure side of DC, which is the Justice Society of America, and have them be set in a Vietnam War movie. Now, I only say this because with the success, the success of Stargirl so far, showing off what the Justice Society is capable of, despite being killed off, is quite an interesting twist to show the reality of being a superhero that it's not all just we win and that's it like there are some doom and gloom to it and as far as i'm aware in america's history vietnam is probably the most traumatic war that they've had for a lot of their veterans mostly yeah. because of how many people got captured and suffered so much ptsd so with that in mind, I think it would be a hell of a great film to try and sort of stem off a bit different, but also tie into America's history. So it's more of a patriotic movie than it is just a war movie. Yeah. So here's my book of ideas that I'm going to run through today and just try to sort of get what ideas I can get from you as well and hopefully if anyone else does watch us we can add to it but essentially I'd start off with a strike team that you'd have like the three main members of the JSA that have actual powers which would be the Flash known as Jay Garrick, Alan Scott which would be known as Green Lantern and Dr. Fate which is also known by Kent Nelson now, obviously, with them three, you think, ah, the movie would be over in five minutes. But I would say that they would be perhaps like the first five, ten minutes of the movie, they're trying to infiltrate Vietnam and they get captured by one of the people working for Vietnam. It could be like a, a rogue nation person from America or someone from a completely different nation but they are the bad guy known as Psycho Pirate. So with Psycho Pirate, he has something called the Medusa Mask, which allows him to manipulate the emotions of other people and essentially warp their minds, which could lead into the whole concept of psychological torture, which is what Vietnam did quite well. So you could easily have the idea that those three somehow got manipulated and somehow captured by Psycho Pirate or just by sheer fluke of the Vietnam War because the main thing to forget, well, people forget about the original JSA was, yes, they were powerful, but they weren't as powerful as they have been since, say, the last past 10 years. Because like, when... Sort of like the most, the most popular incarnations of the characters that we've seen. Well, the thing is, it's like with the Flash Jay Garrick, right? He could only originally run about 30 to 40 miles an hour. Like he wasn't yeah. stupidly quick, but he was quick, quick enough. enough. Yeah. It wasn't until the introduction of Barry Allen and Wally West that it delved into the idea that within DC, they have something called the Speed Force, which gave speed to their powers and thus they could go supersonic and break the time barrier slash dimensional barrier yeah. so with that in mind it would give you the opportunity to see a speedster without the lightning because in the cw series every single speedster has lightning which is yeah. fair enough because that's the generic thing that most speedsters have these days but jay garrick didn't start off like that 
No. His powers didn't come from lightning. That's the weirdest part of it all. Despite the fact that he's a lightning emblem, his powers came from... Um, he was basically doing some water um, purification tests on water. He was trying to find a way of purifying it more. And the chemicals evaporated in the lab while someone was attacking him. He got knocked out cold. The water vapors end up like going through his lungs, sped up his metabolism, and end up giving him super speed. But he didn't have any lightning. He just ran quite quick. So... Yeah, so essentially with this movie, you'd have them three captured, and then of course you'd end up having like a brief flashback of how they gained their powers. So you'd have like that scene I just mentioned with Jay Garrick. You'd have with Alan Scott, I would keep in the idea that he was a railroad engineer and the train crashes and he ends up surviving because of the Green Lantern power battery and thus becomes Green Lantern. Yeah. Kent Nelson was well, his origin's a bit of an odd one. So he was an archaeologist, and he is excavating Naboo's hidden temple, comes across the Helmet of Fate, which is Naboo's, and he gets stuck inside. But while he's stuck inside, he's being trained by Naboo in the many mystical arts that he is capable of. And he comes out like five years later or something along those lines, fully mastered of the mystical arts and hasn't actually like aged a day. Yeah, it's it's a very odd one, but so, so how much time actually passes, do you know? Well, like I say, he's stay he's stuck inside the tomb for the best part of five years doing all this training to be the like oh, right, right, Doctor right, Fate. Yeah. So I did I just find it a very random explanation but then again it was like really early on comics so at the end of the day they just had to try and squeeze in an origin without getting too convoluted yeah so you could also perhaps have the scene where all three of them are all working together you could have like various different like covert missions they've had together just before they get captured and then it cuts to back in america where you got an army bunker with commander steel so Commander Steel technically doesn't have powers, but he does in a way, it's a bit of an odd one. Like he has super strength, but it's down to enhancing his bone structure and get he literally has like implants in his like joints and stuff. So he's like the million dollar man in a sense. Yeah. But probably don't cost that much. But essentially, like Commander Steel has relative super strength. But it's only down to bionic enhancement. It's not an actual superpower. It's more of a tech thing. Yeah. So I would have him. I know it sounds an odd one, but did you ever see the A team? Yes, I did see the A team. So you know the leader of the A team is Hannibal. Yeah. That sort of attitude, that sort of rustic sort of character is what I would have Commander Steel to be like. So like a rough and ready kind of type. Yeah, exactly. Like he's very patriotic, rough and ready, but also know how to be quite witty and quite sarcastic. So you'd have him in the army bunker and he'd be messaged by someone who's keeping tabs on the um, the three that have gone into Vietnam saying they've been captured. We need to get a strike team to try and rescue them before things go wrong. So... He's then looking at his board of recruits and you'd end up looking at the top three non-powered people I would have to be as the JSA members that go and rescue them. Yeah. So you'd have like a brief scene of Dr. Midnight working on his goggles. You'd have Wildcat training in the boxing ring and you'd have our man testing his chemicals. Because technically, as I well, the majority of the JSA... I feel the hodgepodge. Like with Justice League, I think the only one that doesn't have powers is Batman. But then again, yeah. he has the power of plot. Like he is Batman, so it's always going to work for him. But with the JSA, it was always a bit of a hodgepodge with like the average Joe. But then there was also a bit of science. There was also a bit of magic. There was a good diversity to it. So yeah. the idea is like you could have. 
you could show off perhaps Dr. Midnight working in the pitch black because the thing is with Dr. Midnight, the very first incarnation at least, I swear that's where Marvel got their inspiration for Daredevil. Yeah, you'd think. <laughs> because the guy is blind. He knows how to like whoop people's ass. But then he makes specialised goggles so he can see in any spectrum of light. But it's like, <laughs> okay, that's quite cool. And then Marvel just pretty much copied and pasted but like left out the goggles. Yeah. And it's just like, that's a bit of a letdown now you sort of look into that. Because I thought it might have been the other way around. But no, Doctor Midnight predates Daredevil. So, yeah. But then you got like characters like Wildcat. He has no powers. He's just literally an ex-boxer. That's literally all it is. But he knows like different martial arts skills. And he's just an absolute arrogant powerhouse. So... Yeah. What was the crazy guy called in the A team? The one that had that just always wound people up that couldn't shut up. Oh, friggin' heck. What was his name? Um, what was his name? No, nah, it's escaped me. But like, I would have like that sort of vibe of a character for Wildcat because at the end of the day, it would make sense to have a wild ish character to be Wildcat. Like yeah. you'd have someone that was capable, fully capable of fighting and all that, but you'd also have like the zany attitude that someone that has no powers whatsoever could easily take on so many people. Yeah. Then the final thing is like with our man, he essentially creates chemicals that can give him super strength. And I'd show like him working on it in the lab. But I would have it so that it was like a unfinished serum or something. So that's why it only lasts an hour. Because the only yeah. downside to our man is the fact that he can only have the super strength for an hour for a day. So right. it's not like an unlimited thing that like you could only have it once per day. So it gives him a sort of tactical reason at how to deploy it instead of just going, ah, oh, just uh, uh, and do, do, do. yeah. <laughs> um what else have we got here so once we got that so we see the scene where they're all sort of being re-recruited -rec for the next team to go and save the more powerful lot i'd have a scene where you got psycho pirate torturing each individual of the guys that they've already captured in different rooms but you could have it on tv screens or something and then have Psycho Pirate talking to a distant voice that would actually be the main bad guy to the film that isn't actually Psycho Pirate. Right. But you wouldn't see who it was. You just have like a shadowy cast over the who it is and just see like a slight darkened figure. Um, so then he's like explaining to his master that they're all uh, resisting his torture and he needs to find a way of increasing it. So we have like them trying to amp up, amp up the empty of however it is that he's trying to torture them, whether it's through the Medusa mask or whether it's some other psychological torture. And then you'd sort of pan across and you'd see like the Green Lantern um, power battery that was Alan Scott's flickering with light, like trying to get out the containment that they've got. Same goes yeah. for the Naboo helmet. So you'd have it like in a different room again, but they're both trying to flicker and trying to get out of their containment. I am. Um, I'd have like perhaps later on the movie with Jay Garrett getting electroshocked like so many times, it would get to the point where you get electroshocked too much and he'd end up getting like an increase in speed. So he then gets the lightning and thus connects to the speed force. Yeah, that kind of just would make a lot more sense than just the end than just the original. He has lightning just because of just because it just because. Well, this is it. I mean, like because at least then it would make him a bit more of a interesting threat in the film in like the later half where he'd just run, be able to run, but he'd have a lightning and he'd be so quick that nobody could actually get hold of him. And he'd be able to do other stuff. Yeah, but then again, it does make into that whole sense thing, which he wasn't. He was naturally that fast. In the beginning, so it's nice no. to actually have a bit more of a more of it explained or 
albeit like your kind of version of a more kind of um, like more down to earth, gritty origin based story. Exactly. So let's have a look. So getting through my notes, second team they fight their through the the second team fight they where their way through Vietnam. So you could have just various random shots of them like getting through the country. You got Commander Steel with like. You, I don't know whether to have him in a proper patriotic suit or whether it be like a patriotic suit but like a noir version like a sort of dark one so it doesn't stick out too much yeah just even though it was like kind of like around the, like around the 60s and everything like what was going around like the 60s like for those kind of films and like series a lot of flashy colours a lot of really bright polished colours so it'd be nice to actually have like a like a 60s style film for Vietnam, which like mm. obviously that time frame with Vietnam, it was like very grimy and muddy and dirty. So it'd be nice to have like a bit more of a like not war torn kind of character, but definitely kind of have that look. So not a lot of color. So it could be like a really dark, beaten up red, blue, yeah. and white. So it's it's still got the patriotic feel to it, but it's more yeah, yeah, worn torn and like it's battered and bruised like the rest of them. Um, and so they eventually obviously find all the others in the base. Wildcat and Owlman split off to find the others. Commander Steel is the one that finds the empty lab that's basically trying to tinker with the uh, the original three's powers, trying to replicate it for the Vietnam army to try and conquer right. America and everywhere else. Which I know sounds like a typical sci-fi plot, but like <clears throat> at the end of the day... Like, what else do you do with someone that's got powers other than try to replicate them? <laughs> <laughs> replicate more? <laughs> well, this is it. So, <laughs> Commander Steel sort of hunts around the lab and sees the Green Lantern power battery and the helmet of Naboo. And he's trying to unlock it from where it is, but obviously he can't because of either it's locked in some manner that he can't deal with or whatever. So from a distance, you hear like Vandal voice, Vandal Savage, the main bad guy, voice, and sort of says along the lines of, "Don't touch it." And then he sort of walks into the lighting, explains like who he is and why he's doing this. And for those of you who may not know, Vandal Savage is one of few characters in DC that is incredibly intelligent and very underused because. He is an immortal from the caveman era. And essentially, within the comics, he took on the guise of ver various dictators. So you've got like um, Vladimir Putin, what? Well, not Vladimir Putin, but um, Rasputin, not, yeah, Rasputin is what I was thinking, not Putin. But he was like, he's played so many like dictatorish roles in his lifetime because he's immortal and he's obsessed with taking over humanity it's what he does yeah so he'll say to like commander steel that i've lived a thousand of like a thousand lifetimes and trying to shape the like world about, into like a, like a thousand lifetimes with a thousand different faces in a sense yes and yeah. it's basically trying to shape the world for his liking for him to rule yeah and so he sort of starts talking about like his experience in his lifetime coming across the Green Lantern power battery, but he doesn't call it the Lantern battery, he calls it the Star Heart. Because in the original comics, that's where the Lantern actually came from. Right, yeah. So within DC, they made it the, the Green Lantern, Alan Scott, gained his powers from a lantern that was actually forged from a meteorite known as Starheart, which was the living fire. And yeah. it's essentially this mystical green energy within DC. So then you could also say, like, the helmet of Naboo was linked to how um, Vandal Savage became immortal in a way, because... While I was watching a series called Young Justice, which is an animated series, they explained that within the continuity of Vandal Savage, he gained his immortality from a meteorite that crashed land on Earth because he decided that it was warm 
and he wanted to sleep next to it to keep warm because that was just his caveman desire. Okay, but yeah. in doing so, the radiation from that gave him immortality, but it also boosted his intelligence, which is why he became a dictator because he was just vastly more intelligent than the rest of humanity. And then later on in Young Justice, it was revealed that his son was actually Naboo, like the actual Naboo, because he like they learned mystical arts and went from there. Now, the one thing that they still use within DC is that they say that the helmet of Naboo and several other mystical artifacts are actually created from a material known as nth metal which uh, yeah n t h yeah nth metal which is essentially from the planet thanagar and it is a very hard wearing metal but it's also very good at being enchanted by mystical energies right uh, so in my opinion what they could do as a random twist in this movie, is say that the metal that from the helmet is also a shrap well pieces of the shrapnel from the meteorite that gave Vandal Savage his immortality. Oh, sorry, I'm just I'm just really I'm just really loving this plot because like I've read through the I've gone through the notes, but there's so much which I'm learning now. I'm actually quite liking this. But this is it, like Vandal Savage hasn't been used an awful lot within DC. Like, they used him in the animated series. And he was used in Young Justice. But, even weirdly, he was used in Smallville. He was played by Dean Dean. I must not, I must not have seen that. I must have missed that. So it was he. It was a very weird version of it, though. That he wasn't a caveman that was immortal. He was from the eighteen hundreds that was immortal, but he gained his immortality from exposure from kryptonite. Yeah, and he basically was trying to preserve his wife because he couldn't live without her. So he basically harvested all of the organs from all these meteor freaks in the show to try and bring his wife back to life. Okay, yeah. But it was just god awful. Like, <sighs> give him juice. Dean Kane does try to act. Don't get me wrong. But it, it it's very try. It's very try. Like the poor guy just can't. I just don't know what it is, but he's not very good at sci-fi stuff. No. <laughs> but trying to think of who to cast uh, who what and where is the biggest issue that i've had with this like the i obviously the end of the film is like the, the good guys win and the bad guys either get captured or whatever but it's now trying to fathom as to who could play who is where i think i can get your opinion okay so who let's right so just like stab a pick of the lot who would you want to cast first I'd need to try and find the perfect version for Alan Scott because in the New 52 they decided to reboot a lot of things in DC including the JSA they wanted to try and modernise it right? and one of the many random things that sadly fell flat was that they decided to make Alan Scott gay yeah. So I don't know whether that would be an interesting thing to try and add into the movie or not. Because while they have only briefly used it for the new 52, the thing is with a lot of movies these days is that you have to include so much diversity to try and get any interest. Yeah, which obviously, which obviously like this, which obviously it's very welcome. Like, it's oh no, of course. Very welcome today, which you know, I'm glad we're getting into like the more kind of uh diverse thing. Which obviously, whereas um, obviously, for anybody who doesn't know, we're probably gonna do a, a video on, on X Men as well, the mm -hmm. new film, but we're not gonna go into that. But we got a load of ideas for that for casting and such and for uh character development, but obviously, that's for another video. But it's definitely for captain for casting with this one for like diversity wise, which is no problem. Um, it's just kind, of, just kind of 
going to be like, what are you going to like? What are you going to focus on for character? Like, what are you going to focus on for character wise? Like actor wise, you know, it's just it's a it's a hard one now. Well, this is it. I mean, let me just show you like how Alan Scott should look in a sense. So, like. So the first one on the left is how the original costume was. It was sort of black, red, green, yellow. It was a hell of a hodgepodge. And for some yeah. bizarre reason, he had a purple eye mask. I don't understand why Green Lantern was purple and every other colour but green. <laughs> that was the one thing green I found. Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But this is the New 52 version that I was on about, like the more modernised one. Yeah. So I don't know whether that would look better or whether to just keep it to the original JSA. Because at the end of the day, it is meant to be set in Vietnam. So it's going to be sort of slightly old ish. But then it's also trying yeah, to make it look. You can't modernize just for the time period. You can't modernize it too much. Otherwise, it just it's going to look goofy no matter how good if the plot is. No, this is it. I mean. At the end of the day, I trying to think of someone trying to think of someone that's already already got blonde hair or sort of blonde ish hair, but taller. Well, what, uh, a good idea. What age bracket would you go for? For the first team, I would say twenty five to thirty. So they're old enough to have experience, but not too old. Yeah. Um, but I'm just trying to think of who could be cast as any of them, really. Um, this is a tough call, ladies yeah. And this is a tough call, actually. Um, I mean, you are right for the casting. This is actually quite hard. Well, this is it because. There's never been any like live action versions of any of this yet. So it, well, apart from Commander Steel, Wildcat. I mean, Doctor Fate was briefly used in Smallville again, but the it was so brief that you just didn't even really acknowledge it. It was just kind of a blink and you'll miss it kind of thing. Well, it's like the guy that was Dr. Fate in Smallville, I don't know if it was due to the long-term exposure from using the helmet or some actual PTSD, but the guy was schizophrenic. Yeah. Which okay. I, found, I found that a really, really stupid idea, to be honest, because like, if that's the case, how come there aren't more superheroes that have PTSD and schizophrenia. Yeah, but mind you, it's just in today's world, it's a very dodgy line in mm. today's world. Um, so that, let's go, skip over Alan Scott for the moment. How about, let me just try and find uh, where are we? How about we try Jay Garrick, then. So let's have a look at the. So, in essence, Jay Garrick is that. Yeah. So, again, the styling would be that it wouldn't be such bright colours, but it would be battered and torn. It'd be visible. I. Mean... The one thing I always found really cool, but I always found it a bit of a random as well, is that he has a helmet that has wings on it to look like the he the helmet of Hermes. Yeah. How the hell does it stay on his head when he's running? Like, I never understood that. I don't see a... Like, is there a strap or anything? No, that? it literally... It's literally a tin hat. It's like an old World War II like old tin World hat. Like an World War II style one. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And then he just adds on the wings to the side. Okay. So, so in terms of costume, 
I don't know whether to have him have that and that be it, or whether he finds a helmet on the battlefield in the second half of the movie and then just adds it onto his costume. I mean, just I mean, it could it like could it be uh, as simple as like a as like a helmet from a friend of his who died in battle, possibly? Yeah, I mean, you could have so the wings aren't actually protruding out, but you could have it like maybe painted on or something. Yeah, but. Again, like I say, the rest of the suit, I don't think it would work as bright colours because they're meant to be a covert team that have had experience. Like, it would make more sense of it being darker colours and more worn torn. Yeah, darker, like darker colours, instead of having a bright, bright red, having sort of like a, uh, instead of like having a bright red for Spider Man, for example, when you have just like a wine red, like really have the same colours, but really dark, really dark contrast. Yes, colors. yeah, exactly. But, the thing is with Dr. Fate, or Kent Nelson, is the fact that his costume manifests from the helmet. So I don't know whether it would be even worth the hassle in actually redesigning it, because technically it is a construct of magic. Like, it's... Yeah. Mm. This, is, this is difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, the helmet has to stay gold. The, yes. It, but I don't know whether you could have it so you take the Doctor Strange approach where it looks more like robes, like enchanted robes that sort of come, like, come to him, or whether it is actually him, his actual clothes, and then he just puts the helmet over the top. I wouldn't have it as actual clothes, to be honest. I really wouldn't. So you could easily have, like, when the helmet gets knocked off him, he could be in a standard army, like, jumpsuit or something with his name tag or whatever. Yeah, I mean, could you have a kind of a thing? I mean, could you have maybe, I don't know, possibly, could you have, like, possibly, nah, dog tags wouldn't really work. Maybe sunglasses, which may materialise, which the helmet might materialise from sunglasses. You know, it's just kind of what concept you're going to go for. I mean, in this kind of world. The thing is, a lot of the time when it comes to the magic stuff in DC, is that they say that they can easily hide their enchanted items in pocket dimensions that follow them. Yeah. It's, which, again, like, it's a cool idea, but it's a bit of a lame ass reason. Yeah. So, I mean, the only thing I could think of, because like I say, Kent Nelson in his origin was that he was trained by Naboo, so he is trained in mystic arts without the helmet. It's not purely just adding the helmet. The helmet just bolsters his power because he ends up being a conduit for Naboo. So you could have it that he has a standard army helmet that he somehow uses to disguise the actual helmet right 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 so it could be like he has to say some sort of enchantment to unlock it to then turn into the actual helmet of naboo yeah so yeah so we got we got the style choice down i mean with wildcat and the others again it's i don't know whether to have them in brand new costumes because you could have it as they haven't had as much experience, so therefore they haven't had their costumes co completely ruined yet. So it's. I don't know. Is that kind? Of, is that kind of go going to kind of be a kind of putting them over too early? Maybe. Well, I mean, like with Wildcat, you've got literally it's a cat suit. I mean, if I can find a better image. Yeah, like a standard morph, morph suit, basically. Essentially, yeah, you could have it. So, <sighs> let me think. Um, I'm trying to find the, the right image to try and showcase it off, but like that is technically what Wildcat is when he's an old man. It's like he's got boxes like wrappings around the, like the ends of the costume, but then he does have an actual costume on top. So.
I mean, like I say, he is a boxer. Like he doesn't have any special gifts or whatever. He just literally is a fighter. So you could have it say that he was a a recruit that's just a bit a bit too much of a gobby recruit that they end up recruit like using because he's well has to redeem himself in some way and go from yeah, that. Yeah, but I still have I'd still have someone a bit more ta tactical to be honest. I just. I just don't really see something like this kind of thing in. Although, however, saying that, if you're going to have it like a bit more taps, like tactical, it's just thinking back to like what of, um, sort of like including like, like maybe the army boots instead, like the mm. end, like straps and a lot of like zip pockets, like on the trousers and everything. I'll probably just keep a maybe a vest, possibly or possibly like you know those long sleeve Under Armour shirts. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just some, I just something go for something a bit more simplistic than this. Yeah, to be so, honest, but some kind of I don't know, some kind of headwear. I'm not sure. Okay, so we got that one down. That's that. Uh, sink. So we got that, and then we got Doctor Midnight, and we got Our Man left to try and sort of pin together in terms of how to look. Uh, where are we? Da, 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 da. On, where are you? So there we go. There's Doctor Midnight. So the goggles, obviously, you have to keep that because, like I say, he's blind and he devised goggles to see in various spectrums of light. Uh, Makes sense, yeah. I never really fully understood the obsession of having him with an owl, but it's somehow part of his character. I mean, in fairness, without the cape, majority of that styling anyway would kind of work in like a sort of army-ish setting. I mean, it is kind of simplistic just as it is, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know, the cow seems a little bit... I, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Like the cape. I mean the cape. Sorry. Instead of mm. having it like maybe maybe attached to the shoulders rather than right the way around. Like kind of too comic booky. And obviously you got the obviously you got the baggy boots. Again, I would just go for simplistic boots. Yeah. So you'd have like standard army boots, standard tactical gear in a sense. The goggles has to stay as they are. I never. DC seemed to have an obsession with capes at the beginning because they seem to not use it much anymore. But it's just any time I see a superhero with capes, I think of that scene from Frozen where you got um, Edna Mode saying, No capes! No, that's from Incredibles. That's what I said. No, it's, well, no for, uh, for some reason I thought you said Frozen. I don't know why. It must have been the way it sounds. <laughs> <from Frozen. laughs> I was going to say, like, when was she in Frozen? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, like, I see the whole thing with, like, capes. I mean, just... I mean, capes, it's not really... A realist... It's, again, just the whole realistic kind of thing, especially for that time. I mean, maybe you could have some kind of incarnation. Like, maybe have it as... I don't know, not as, like, maybe a jacket, but have, like, kind of, like, the flare of a cape, possibly. Possibly. You know, uh... it just kind of... It just kind of just makes it a bit more prat. It just it's a bit more practical, not like a trench mm. coat, but something similar. Something similar at least, because I just yeah, it's the practicality of the cape that I think is a bit hard to try and add into any it's movie. Lo it's lost on me. Like unless the superhero can fly, it's sort of a bit of a wasted opportunity. So again. It's quite a dark tone for our man. You have to keep the hour piece because that's where the chemicals are. It's the cape is the biggest issue. That's the only thing I find difficult to try and redesign yeah, a lot of these capes, capes. capes. But this is it, like this is my biggest issue I have with trying to redesign these characters for a movie. The practicality of the cape is hard to try and justify. I personally get. I personally, for out, I get rid of the capes. Although the like the whole hourglass thing, like I quite like. Even though like the idea, you might disagree, but two ideas: possibly either having it as maybe a pendant, or possibly having it as an actual uh, for his 
it's all like costume or, or wear. Sorry, as like an emblem, possibly. But it normally is a pendant. It, it literally is just a mini like hourglass that flips over as a pendant. So I could see that because then you could easily add in the plot idea that someone tries to steal it off him and smash it to the ground. Or because the thing is, if you add it into the suit, then it means that the suit is the thing that actually has the powers, not him. Uh. Yeah, see what I mean? Like, it'd be cool to add it into the suit, but then the problem is, it's like if the suit gets broken, then the suit doesn't work. <laughs> I thought I was onto something. <laughs> nah, no. This is why we have these random rave moments, because at the end of the day, there's only so much that I can actually come up with on my own. But. <sighs> Like I say, at the end of the movie, obviously, everyone joins together and the bad guys are beaten and that's it. But yeah. I want to sort of tinker with an idea with you as to whether... Would you have it so they stay as like a covert team for the USA so then you could use it again in a sequel for a different type of like war movie? Or would you have it so they all decide that they want out of the army life and they form their own thing, which then like transpires to become the JSA? I I'd, I'd go the latter way. I would actually have them like completely defect from the army. So they end up being like their own independent thing and stay in America. Yeah. Okay. I mean, would so, you go the other way? Well. I would like the idea that if they, if we could think of a sequel to go for this and they end up being like a covert team fully, that midway through the movie that they decide that they've had enough of being like the go-to team when everything goes to poop and thus they decide to retire from the army but still have a responsibility to their country in a sense. Yeah. Because... Obviously, that you could have the idea that they don't want to be. They don't want to be like the firing gun for using against innocent countries, but they want to protect America and their citizens. Yeah, it's like, well, you're obligated, well, you're obligated to protect your country, especially after you've had that whole kind of um, army influence beforehand. It's not like you can, like, they'll be able to just switch that off. Otherwise, no. what's the point in maybe doing a second film? No, exactly. But so yeah, we got the general gist of the movie. We just need to try and think of the actors. That's the biggest hard thing that out of all of this is trying to piece the actors together. Well, that's the best thing about this because there is gonna be a part two of this. Yeah. Yeah, I think part two we're gonna to have to try and add in who to play in who. Yeah. I'm trying to think, what else can part two be? I think we need to try and discuss at least part two, like other minor characters that we can add to it as like, either in the American sense, like the art, uh, the American army, like which people sort of behind the scenes are sort of tagged in with the JSA or at least spawn in more like hints towards the JSA history because there are so many different members, it's unreal. Oh, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we could easily have like the entire Justice Society of America, but it would end up being five minutes, not five minutes long, this movie, because there are so many of them. Um, I mean, is there anything else you want to add to this before we shoot off? I uh, don't think so, but, main, but mind you, there is one thing. Obviously, you want to have this set in Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to do a second film with this, how much of a time jump? How much of a time jump do you have? Because the Vietnam was in when was it? Was it early 1960s Vietnam? I think so. It was early 1960s, and it went on for quite a while. I don't know, maybe more after, after that. I can't remember exactly what year. Uh, it might be 67. I'm sorry if any Americans are watching this, but because um, I was thinking, like, what happens like roughly after that? JFK. Mm. I mean, 
I would have the movie set in like the last year of the Vietnam War, so you could end it with like the JSA being the ones to finish the war, so you got like no cliffhangers from that. So then the second movie, you could have maybe a five year like time jump or something. So it's not too close to the first one, but it gives you enough time to try and add in a new sort of element to everything else and have like other things that I mean I don't know a lot of American history because being British that we don't have much chaos but yeah I mean like I say it'd have to be at least a five year time jump because if you'd only done it like a year after it would be like too much too soon. Yeah. Um. Because when was I mean, the? Oh yeah, yeah. Go on, you go first. When was like the whole like Cold War with Russia? Because that was what the early part of the eighties. This is what I was just about to talk about. Actually, yeah, it was. It was actually, and um. Because you had the Cold War, and I think right about the same time, maybe just before that, you had the um, you had kind of like the whole battle between. Um, I'm not sure if it was a result of the Cold War. I could be wrong, but I'm not sure if it maybe it was a factor that led to it. But do you remember, like back um, like back then, obviously in the 60s, you had the space race between I think it was the Americans and the Russians fighting yes. to get to the moon first. Yeah, and then. Then there was the whole thing about um, different kind of nuclear technology, which yeah. uh, the Russians had, I think. So that could be an idea, like to maybe go off into Russia, possibly. Okay, so then we could have like the whole space you, you race. Kind of slash... yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, yeah, I like the idea of that. But then, so second movie could be all about the space race and the nuclear arms race or whatever. I'm trying to think of a decent DC villain that could orchestrate that because that sort of thing is like another thing that Vandal Savage would do really well, but then it's like you don't want to reuse him again. Yeah, but then it's kind of like I, it, I wouldn't set like the film like in the parameters of space or anything like that because I think that's just that is too much too soon. Mm. You know, it's, it has to, you know, it has to be set in a much more kind of. Uh, Nuzzle Koba, kind of like dark and dingy sterile uh kind of Russia, like the brutality like the brutality of like when you had the Russian government and so on. And then it was like the kind of the it was a war for a lot of is it was kind of like a battle for a lot of years between like the technology that the Americans had and the technology that the Russians had. And then I think it was a factor which led to the Cold War. I could be wrong. I'm not mm. too sure it's loosely based on that. Okay. Um Okay, so that'd be quite an interesting one. It's just trying to think of who to have as a villain. Um I mean I mean could you even could you even set it for I've got so many ideas in my head at the minute, it's just hard to get piece one together. Out. Yeah. Um I mean, there's a really random character that the JSA have as a villain called the Gambler. Oh, yeah. And he's not very well known in the comics. They use, I think they've just introduced the idea of him in Stargirl. But essentially, he is just this type of guy that likes to take the idea of thrills and like winning against all odds and that sort of like aesthetic. Yeah. So you could have it in the sense that the gambler is just trying to interfere between America and Russia because he's trying to see who could be the first to win the space race. It's him being obsessed with gambling to try and like interfere with the two of them. Yeah, or possibly like the whole in the whole thing with like fuck like find out who has the best technology and what the best technology and everything, whether that be uh, for an arm, for a, like a space arms race, or whether that could be for weapon, like for weapons base, because they like, had the nuclear age then. 
Well, um, then, so it could be like trying to obtain like obtain different information from like the Americans, maybe secret plans, like covert operations, and then maybe piecing maybe piecing together their own uh, kind of weapon weapon of mass destruction or kind of a way to uh, take down America as a whole, possibly. Yeah, so then you could easily add in the idea of another character that has a similarish name called Roulette, who is this Asian woman who essentially has like all these like um, black market sort of ties that she basically manipulates and uses against various nations. So yes, you could have the yeah. Roulette and the Gambler, and yeah. oh, that would be brilliant. Did you? Because Roulette was actually in um, Justice League Unlimited. If you ever watched that series. Oh, really? Yeah, she was the Asian woman in the red dress with a dragon tattoo. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember now. So you could have her in it, and like I say, you could have the gambler as well. So you could literally just be them two trying to pit against the Americans versus Russia and go from there. Yeah, and that's like the kind of like maybe, uh, I don't know, have like the kind of the whole scheme of like one, uh, like one spy, one spy for a like believing that this, like having the American government believing that they're spying for America and we're spying for Russia and then vice versa with the other character that's mm -hmm. obtaining information together. Yeah, exactly. And so they both obtain both countries' information and they yeah. end up selling it up on the black market in some way. Yeah, and so on, like on the black, yeah, just like maybe selling off like the plans or whatever or technology. Onto the onto the black market to a secret, not kind of not kind of a, an Illuminati kind of group, but something similar. Yeah, take control over America, maybe possibly America's government or something. Yeah. So then, obviously, you'd have to add in some new JSA members, and. I know it sounds an odd one, but I would bring in the idea of Black Canary. Oh, yeah. Because you could have it so that she seems like a sweet and innocent, like, typical character. Kind of like what Black Widow was in Iron Man 2, where she was just a female, very attractive female that was in the right place at the right time. And yeah. then it sort of transpires that, obviously, she is more than that. And with Black canary she has the metagene of a sonic cry when she screams it literally just creates like a sonic boom yeah now i don't know whether to have it so she just always has it or there is some means like randomly in that movie that she has a metagene activated and thus has a bit of issues trying to deal with it and eventually gains control because unlike Marvel, DC don't have an awful lot of spy stuff. No. I mean, they tried doing it a few years ago, and it kind of worked, but at the end of the day, like, it was more of an evil organisation than anything else. It wasn't actually spy. It was just, uh, we're this secret organisation, like many secret organisations that somehow just been hidden for all these years that Batman never knew, but somehow got caught in the end that was it <laughs> yes so so yeah you could have black canary as like the female not assassin but like the female like the dc equivalent to black widow where she doesn't seem threatening but she ends up kicking everybody's butts yeah um the other thing as well is, obviously, with DC, they they don't like delving into their multiverse much. So I don't know whether to actually have it set within the actual DC EU that we got so far, where we got Ben Affleck's Bad Batman and so on, or whether we could just have it an entirely different reality completely, so we don't have this issue of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman to try and tie into it. Oh. Oh. Yeah, this this is the big thing that I hate about DC. That I love their multiverse. Don't get me wrong; they have such brilliant ideas, and then they just sort of fall a bit flat when they try to sort of use it, like in live action. Like they've had, 
to declutter the TV shows and use Crisis on Infinite Earths to try and simplify things, but they ended up I know, making. I know. But they've made things more complicated now, so it ends up being like, well, how could we add this into DC in their like live action universe if it were to happen and people actually liked it? Yeah. You could also have as a random Easter egg idea one of the scientists that could get captured by Roulette or the Gambler called T.O. Morrow. Now, Dr. T.O. Morrow is the guy that creates a, an android called Red Tornado. Yeah. T.O. Morrow is a, is a bad guy and created the Red Tornado to infiltrate the JSA to try and spy on them and thus sort of take them down. But the android yeah. gains sentience in a sense and reverts from his programming and actually becomes a good guy. So it's kind of like Vision from Marvel. That's what I was just about to say. Yeah, Vision. yeah they sort of kept... The problem is, I think... Vision and Red Tornado were made by the same guy, like the same creator, because a lot of the early on like characters in DC and Marvel were both written by the same character, like the same writers or whatever. But they were just tweaked to try and make them not as similar. Yeah, but you could have the idea of T.O. Morrow working with Roulette and Gambler to try and suss out the like logistics of the tech. But you could also have the idea him trying to tinker with the Red Tornado to try and take down the JSA. But it ends up obviously going wrong and bring in that Red Tornado. But <sighs> again, it's just trying to figure out how to style it because they tried doing Red Tornado and Supergirl and it was horrendous. There we go. So, the one on the right is how Red Tornado looks in the comics, obviously, and the one on the left is Supergirl. Let me try and zoom in to try and explain it a bit more. Like... Oh, yeah. Like, it just... that like, You can tell it. Um, obviously... Obviously, they couldn't fully CGI in, but it's like you can tell it's made up of like random body armor for like BMXing and then just spray painted red and gold. But it looks yeah. rust. It looks more rusty than red. Yeah. <laughs> it just looks like he's been found in the scrapyard, and then he's just really miffed off because nobody found him. Yeah, or nobody took care of him and not oiled him up. No, <laughs> that sounded horrible. <laughs> Keep it, PG, <laughs> keep it PG. Keep it PG. Keep it PG. But yeah, like I say, you could bring in Red Tornado as a random Easter egg. I wouldn't obviously use him, but you could have it as a random idea that T.O. Morrow uses for the JSA, but obviously it doesn't happen. Um, but I'm trying to think. I don't know what else to add to this because, like I say, the hardest part of all is trying to cast everybody. Which will have to be for part two of this yeah. video. Yeah, that will have to be for the second stream, I think. But is there anything else you want to add to this before we go? I don't think so, but mind you, for part two, I'm looking forward to more. Uh, once we've got the kind of the whole casting bit out of the way in the first half, then I would definitely love to dive in and do a deep dive into the like the five, maybe a five year time jump, what mm -hmm. what was happening right about that time. So it gives us time to gather some re gather some research and bounce back some ideas to jump forward into the next live stream. Okie doke. So well we've been ranting and raving as usual for about an hour. It's not really anything proper. It's just us two nerding out as usual, trying to figure out what DC could do besides anything Batman and Superman related, because that's all they seem to be obsessed with. So thanks for joining us. 
this will be edited soon to go on YouTube, and we will get part two soon. It'll probably be next week or even the week before, uh, week after, sorry, not week before. And I hope you all guys are all staying safe during this COVID. It's not over with, but we are still trying to do the best we can. So stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you all soon. Bye.